The most difficult thing for me to deconstruct when I left my Christian faith was the fear of hell. It lingered long after I stopped going to church and long after I stopped believing in the biblical God. I held on to that fear of hell for so many years after I decided that I was no longer a Christian. I had that nagging thought in the back of my mind of, what if I'm wrong? What if I die tomorrow and I stand before God and he looks me in the eyes and he says, depart from me, I never knew you, and tosses me into the pits of hell. I get messages from people every single day that say, I can't shake this fear of hell. I'm so afraid that I might be wrong. How do I get rid of this fear? The fear can be so debilitating for so many people that often it keeps them from leaving. Even when they're finding the belief nonsensical or unbelievable, they stay because they are afraid. This fear can halt critical thought. It can disrupt your desire for freedom. And it can keep you mentally and emotionally trapped in a religion that you might not even find believable anymore just because you are so afraid. So today, I want to help those who are struggling with that, what if I'm wrong? That lingering thought in the back of their mind, what if I've made a mistake? What if I'm wrong? And what if I go to hell? How do I stop being afraid? I always say that the best way, the most effective way to deconstruct your faith is to ask the hard questions and follow them wherever they may lead you. There's a reason that when you start having doubts or questions that your church leaders respond with things like, you're being too logical. You just need to have faith. Just read your Bible. You're thinking too much. These are thought terminating cliches that are used to either intentionally or unintentionally halt the process of critical thought to stop you from thinking too much about what you believe and to keep you where you're at with blind obedience and blind faith because their goal is to get you to stop thinking rationally and critically. Any belief that requires you disregard critical thought, reason, rationality is probably not a belief worth holding. So let's jump in and let's ask the hard questions together. But when I reflect on this fear of hell, I can't help but ask the question, is it rational? Why are we fearing something that lacks tangible evidence? The concept of hell as depicted in religious teachings often involves eternal torment of either the physical body or the soul or the mind or all three. But what basis do we have to accept this notion without critical examination? One crucial point to consider is the vast diversity of belief in hell. Different denominations have completely different ideas of what hell is, how you end up there, why you end up there. Is it eternal torment? Is it annihilation? Do you get burned for a moment? Do you get burned forever? Do you get burned at all? This alone, to me, raises so many doubts about the legitimacy of this claim of hell because none of these groups can seem to come together to figure out what hell actually is. You put 10 different Christians in the room and ask them, what is hell? Where does it come from? Who goes there? Why do people go there? Ask them all the questions and they're gonna give you a wide assortment of answers and they're all going to disagree with one another and they're probably going to spend all day long disagreeing with one another and they're going to have scripture to back up their claims. So who's right? Who's wrong? It's all about subjective interpretation and can we really even prove that hell is a place that exists that people go to if we can't even decide on what it looks like and what happens there and who goes there? Scholarly research shows that hell is likely not what a lot of these uh, kind of fire, hell, and brimstone evangelical fundamentalist churches want you to believe that it is. Bart Ehrman in his book Heaven and Hell presents completely alternative views than what a lot of us heard growing up in the churches. He presents alternative views that suggest that there is no fiery torment for unbelievers. Instead, he promotes the idea that Jesus most likely spoke about annihilation or, you know, kind of one big deep sleep for those that, you know, don't go into God's kingdom. Even with all of these alternative interpretations, the fear still exists because fear indoctrination works. When we've been deeply ingrained with this idea that eternal torment waits for us at the end of our lives if we don't believe in Jesus, breaking free from that psychological stronghold is no easy feat. Fear lingers, it sits and festers in our mind, and it can affect so many aspects of who we are and how we live our lives. It impacts our thoughts, our beliefs, our emotions, our behaviors, and even our everyday decision-making can be impacted by this fear. 
So I think it's really important to take this fear and kind of break it apart from the inside. And once you can kind of pick that apart, then you can rebuild from there. You can figure out where to go from there. You have to deconstruct before you can reconstruct. And so that's why it's really important to understand that especially for those that are watching that are like, oh, well, you know, we could just tell people about how, you know, hell is just Gehenna, a burn pit on the outskirts of the city. And, you know, it's not really fiery torment. It's, it's eternal death or it's annihilation. That doesn't matter for people who are deeply indoctrinated with fear to believe that if they die and they've gotten it wrong, Jesus is going to toss them into the fire pit. And that's where they're going to be for all of eternity. That is a very real fear. It is valid to be af afraid of that when you've been indoctrinated with it. And so I think we need to figure out, is this belief rational? Should we hold this belief before we even explore all of the other options? I got to say that even if you believe that you are to be annihilated at the end of your life, or you're just going to be burned a little bit or judged or, and then go into a deep sleep, whatever it is, um, I think all of those are, are pretty harsh punishment for unbelief. You know, if the system is that you deserve eternal reward for believing um, or eternal punishment of some sort for non-belief, well, that's going to invoke a lot of anxiety in people here on earth. So I think regardless of if you believe in annihilation or you believe in eternal torment, that fear still lingers. And the goal is to ask ourselves, is this fear rational? Why do I believe this? Who told me to believe it? Why do they believe it? What are their motives or their intentions for telling me to believe this? Are they only believing it because someone else told them to believe it? Do they have any concrete evidence or proof that this is something to actually fear? Or has it been passed on for a very long time and then it ended up at you? Just because a lot of people believe something doesn't make it true. And so if you're only believing in this eternal fiery torment because your parents told you or your pastor told you, well, they could be wrong. And isn't it worth exploring if they were wrong? Could they be wrong about what they're saying? And if so, is it really fair for you to live your life in fear over what someone else has decided they believe? based off of, of blind faith or based off of something that their parents or their pastor told them? These are all questions you should be asking yourself when you're trying to determine if this belief is rational. And if it is irrational, that's okay. Sometimes we hold irrational beliefs. It happens all of the time. Um, but being able to recognize and pinpoint that the belief is irrational, that can make it a lot easier to deconstruct and disregard it if it is no longer serving you. The next question I think is really important to ask yourself is, do I believe that hell is a just punishment for sin? Or better yet, uh, as, as many Christians believe, is hell a just punishment for non-belief? Because remember, the whole point of the gospel is not just that you're sinless, because Anybody who's saved or has accepted Jesus continues to sin. Um, any Christian will tell you that. So what it boils down to is what you believe about God, what you think about God. You have to believe in a 2,000 year old resurrection that we only know about based on, you know, some ancient writings that have been altered and manipulated over time. And your belief in that event, that resurrection event, is what determines where your soul goes. It's what determines if you should be punished for all of eternity. Is that fair? Is that just? And when we contemplate the nature of justice and punishment, we're faced with very profound questions. We're faced with a lot of questions when it comes to this specific system that we're being presented. I mean, is eternal suffering an appropriate response to finite crimes to something you do here in a finite universe, should you be infinitely punished for that? Can we truly consider God a loving and good and fair and just God if he condemns people to eternal torment? I mean, some people argue that justice should be restorative. It should, the, the end goal is to rehabilitate people so that they can grow and become better individuals. And is God a good and loving God if he sends them off to be punished eternally with no chance of rehabilitation, no opportunity for growth, what's the point? 
And I think this probably makes a great case for annihilation. People who believe in annihilation see, say, well, you know, they just go into a big deep sleep. They're not tormented for all of eternity. But again, that that's still a punishment. A lot of people who have very bad anxiety could have a lot of issues, a lot of um, kind of emotional anguish over the thought that they're just going to be tossed into darkness forever while everybody else gets to have their special reward in heaven. So when you're looking at the system, you have to ask yourself, is this fair? Is this reasonable? And is this actually just? Why is it that after you die, it is too late to believe? too late to be restored. Why is God only going to show up and give you the absolute proof you need to believe in him, the thing that will save your soul? Why is he waiting to give you the proof until after it's too late, after you're already dead? How come at that moment he can't give you the opportunity to grow? Um, give us give us a middle ground, you know? Um, give us the opportunity to grow and make it right. Why is it too late when we die? Again, is that a just system? Is it fair? It really seems as though hell isn't a place for restoration. It's not a place to, to teach people a lesson. It's just a place for God to get out of all of his wrath. And his wrath is unending because the torment is unending. Why is he so angry? Why is he continuing to be so angry into eternity? And if you believe in a good God, a God of love and grace and mercy and compassion, that seems incompatible with a belief in a God that would send anybody to be burned in eternity for what they did or did not believe. And so as we continue this journey of questioning and rationalizing these beliefs, there's another really important question. And I think this one is fundamental to deconstructing the sphere of hell. And that question is, what do I believe about God? Now, this is loaded, especially if you have been indoctrinated, you have been taught to believe very specific things about God and they have been drilled into your mind and it's very hard to think outside that box. I get it. I was there. It took me years to climb outside of, you know, that little bubble that I was raised in to believe that God was a specific way. But I think it's really, really important that you sit down and you ask yourself, what do I believe about God? If, if it is true that God created you. God made you with intent. He gave you the brain he gave you. He gave you the mind he gave you. He gave you the intentions that you have. Um, if you are created in the image of God and God has put you on this earth for her purpose, then I think the best way to come to know that God, whoever that God might be, is to do so through means of self-exploration, to look inside because if God exists and God is everywhere, God is inside of you. And so that would be the best place to look instead of looking for someone else to tell you what to believe, for a pastor or a theologian or your parents or society or anyone else to tell you what to believe, including me. I think the best thing you can do for yourself is to look inside and to ask yourself, if God exists, who, who is God? What is God? What does God look like? What are his characteristics, her characteristics, their characteristics? What do I believe about God? If God has given you the brain and the logic and the reasoning that you use to come to conclusions about your reality, would it not be contradictory for that same God to discourage us from using the brain that he gave us to come to conclusions about our reality? Why would he want you to disregard these faculties that he's given you so that you can believe what other people want you to believe? And how are you even supposed to know which people to trust? Because they're all giving us different answers. If you've walked away because it's just not believable, because you're maintaining your intellectual integrity, because it doesn't make sense, and you're using your brain to come to that conclusion, the brain that God gave you, why would God punish you? for using that brain to come to that conclusion. You know, many individuals from religious communities, from Christian communities, will accuse us of leaving because we don't want to be held accountable or we just want to sin or we're thinking too much, we're being too logical, we don't have enough faith. But I think it's really important not to let other people tell you what your journey is or how you feel. Because chances are, if you've walked away, you were probably very devoted. You probably did seek God. You probably spent a lot of time praying or reading your Bible, seeking out people who could help you, who could guide you. You probably spent a lot of time being very genuine in your search for God. 
and nobody else gets to determine how genuine you were in your search. They don't get to determine that you weren't genuine enough or that you just wanted to sin or that, you know, you don't have enough faith. They don't get to determine that because you know you, you know your journey, you know what you've gone through to get to where you are. And if God exists and God is all knowing and seeing, then God knows what's going on inside your brain. God knows the journey that you've been on way better than all of those people who are trying to keep you in the church, who are trying to scare you into staying in the church. If God is looking at you, knowing that you're as genuine as you know that you are, and God is good, then God would never punish you for doing the right thing and walking away from something that was unbelievable, nonsensical, or harmful to you. And using reason and rationality and critical thought is the opposite of faith because you're actually rooted in reality. You're rooted in the world that if God exists, God put you in. And why would God want you to suspend your critical thought, your reason, your rationality for the single most important thing on earth or, you know, into eternity, your soul? A good God wouldn't. A good God would know you, would know your heart. And most likely the reason you walked away is because it didn't make sense. It was harmful. The doctrine was wrong or it was hurting you or hurting other people. Your empathy, your reason, your rationality, those are things that brought you away. How could that be bad? And if God is the giver of rationality and reason and logic and love and empathy, and you're using those things to determine that this system is not making sense, it's not worth following, it's not worth believing, then you're doing the most godly thing you can do by walking away. If God wants a relationship with you and you're seeking God, then it is God's responsibility to show up and give you the information that you need to believe and to come to know him or her or them. And if you haven't gotten that from God, even in your genuine search, then there's no reason you shouldn't walk away. You shouldn't find another path for yourself, a more genuine, authentic path. If God put you here, God wants you to live your most authentic life. And if you're only believing in something through fear or because it was indoctrinated or because other people told you, are you being genuine in your faith? And wouldn't God want you to be genuine? How can you be genuine with something that doesn't make sense to you? And does God really care if you believe in him or her or them? Does God really care about what you believe about them? What do you believe about God? Do you believe God is a good God? Do you believe goodness and love and compassion and empathy come from God? Do you believe justice and fairness come from God? If so, then you're on the right path by walking away. You're doing the right thing. You're doing the most godly thing that you can do. And if you searched, if if you had faith, if you tried, which I'm sure you did, if you're watching this video right now and you're, you're fearing hell, a good God would understand that. A good God would be a lot more understanding than all of those people at church who are using fear to try to keep you in the pews. We have to realize that walking away from a church, losing faith, or rejecting certain beliefs should not be a punishable offense. It is an exercise of personal autonomy, a testament to our commitment of truth and authenticity. The God exists and is truly a good and fair God. It is inconceivable that this God would punish us for maintaining our intellectual integrity, for following our conscience and pursuing what aligns with our values and understanding of the world we live in. It is essential that we keep exploring and asking questions and following those questions wherever they may lead and maintaining an authentic place in the universe rather than submitting to something because it was indoctrinated into us or it was fed to us by means of fear. And if you are living a life that reflects your genuine convictions and if you are guided by reason and compassion and integrity, then I have no reason to believe, and I don't think that you have a good reason to believe, that a good, fair, just God would ever punish you for that. So let's recap some of these very crucial questions in our journey of deconstructing this fear of hell. Starting with, is the fear rational? Is the belief rational? 
Do you have good concrete reasons to believe that you could potentially end up in hell one day? Is it a fair system? Is it a just system? Would a good loving God send anyone to eternal torment just for unbelief? And third, what do you believe about God? Why do you believe this about God? If God exists, would God be loving and good and just and fair? If God is good and loving and just and fair, would God punish you forever for not believing in him when he hasn't provided you with adequate reasons to believe? And before I sign off, there's just one last thing that I want to add. Christian leaders, apologists, those who want to control and oppress you, they know that the, the most effective tool for getting you to stay where they want you to stay, to think and believe what they want you to think and believe is fear. And if they can make you afraid, they can make you do almost anything. Fear can be paralyzing, debilitating, and all-consuming. It affects how we think, how we behave, how we make decisions, and how we live our lives. It can cloud judgment, it can suppress critical thinking, and it can prevent us from fully exploring all of the alternative perspectives, all of the possibilities. Keep us trapped within the confines of a belief system that might not align with our values or promote spiritual growth. And recognizing this is crucial to our deconstruction journey, especially if we are trying to overcome the fear of hell. By understanding that fear is often employed to maintain control, we can start to question the authenticity and the integrity of the beliefs that we hold, the beliefs that we have been taught to hold. We can reclaim our autonomy and we can free ourselves from the shackles of fear-based beliefs. Remember that love is far more powerful than fear. And if a belief system is truly grounded in love and compassion and grace and mercy and empathy, then it should be able to uplift and inspire, not invoke fear and uncertainty. Even the Bible says that in perfect love, fear is cast out. So if somebody is using fear to bring you to a doctrine, that doctrine is not rooted in love. If people have to use fear in order to get you to believe in God, that God is not a God of love. You cannot love someone into a doctrine that is not loving, and that is why they use fear so often to get you to believe it. Embrace the path that most represents your values, your intuition, your love, and your most authentic path. So as we conclude this episode, I just want to encourage you to keep asking questions. Keep picking apart this doctrine. Ask yourself if this is rational. Ask yourself if, if this is a belief that serves you or if this belief is even true. Seek out resources that can help you overcome these fears, that can maybe teach you alternative perspectives. Recoveringfromreligion.org is a fantastic resource for anyone who is having these fears, these doubts, who have left the church, who are experiencing religious trauma. They have an entire section on resources for sorting through all of the things that we have to sort through when we're deconstructing, including this fear of hell. So I really encourage you to get on their site, recoveringfromreligion.org, check out all of the resources resources and options they have available to help you get through this because you are not alone. It might feel like you were alone. It is a very isolating place to be when you have left your community and everything you've known, everything you've built your life around, but the freedom is worth it. The freedom is the greatest reward that you can give yourself. So stay on your most authentic path and know that you have been genuine in your search and nobody else has the right to make you feel as though you haven't. And nobody else has the right to use fear to keep you under the control of beliefs, systems, and doctrines that are nonsensical and dangerous. It takes a lot of courage to question everything you've ever believed in. And if you've made that step, I applaud you. And I think you're doing great. And you just need to stay on the path. Stay true to yourself. Stay true to your love and your compassion and your empathy. Maintain your intellectual integrity. Embrace the freedom to think and explore and consider all of the alternative perspectives and all of the possibilities. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope I gave you something to think about. I hope that I provided you with some questions that might spark your deconstruction of this very real fear of hell and understand that this is a journey and there's no time limit on your recovery or your healing process. It's okay if you're stuck in these fears. It's okay if you're confused and having doubts. I think the most important thing is that you maintain your intellectual integrity, you stay true to yourself, and stay on the path that feels most authentic to you. I'll see you next time.